Thank you very much, uh, Moshe, Bar, Moshe Bar Asher, for introducing me. I'm very glad to be here. It's a great opportunity. In fact, it's also the first time that I'm in Israel, but I'm enjoying my stay very much. And I would like to thank the organizers for having invited me and for having made this conference possible. I think it's it is already a great event, and it's going to be a greater event, probably, uh, most likely. <laughs> anyway, so let's give it a start. Clause combining between nominalization, finiteness, and uh, information structure. Uh, I have to learn now. How to, well, okay. So I would like to start with Polotsky again. Of course, I am not an Egyptologist, but I would also like to show how Egyptian is just another language, as we mentioned, and since Egyptian actually, as far as we perceive it nowadays, is a written language, I will also show examples from another written language, namely classical Chinese, but that will not be the only language. I will look at a number of different languages for showing how uh, Polotsky's idea, the so-called standard theory, even though I think he didn't like that term, uh, but anyway, I'm using it here, in the idea, with this idea that there are substitutional rules, transpositions of verbs into the syntactic functions of substantives, adjectives, and adverbials. To give you a, a very short, uh, so now that's the standard theory here. To give you a very short example with an invented example from uh, Schenkel, 1990. Uh, here is a sentence like with, with the word cook, the verb, man, fish, in pot. And the translation would probably something, be something like the man cooks fish in the pot. Now, in uh, Polotsky's interpretation, what I marked here by red is actually a nominalized form. So the verbal form here P is, is, is verbal, uh, uh, is nominal, or is transposed, is transformed into a nominal form, so we would have to translate that into something like that the man cooks fish, and then the copula is, and the prepositional phrase, the adverbial element in the pot. So the verb form is nominal, some sort of relative abstract, as he said, or eine Art relative form, as he called it later, and the clause as such is a cleft sentence, une phrase coupée, or in German, spalt, spalt satz. Now the question I would like to address is to what extent is this analysis adequate? Are forms of, the, of this uh, particular type, like the form in which we find Cook in example one, still nominal at a later stage of language development? Uh, well, starting out from Givon's famous uh, pathway of grammaticalization, who states that what was discourse in the past can become syntax in the present, and the rest of the grammaticalization past doesn't interest me in my presentation, so I'll focus on discourse becoming syntax. I will show now how the interaction of three domains, namely nominalization, finiteness, <coughs> and information structure, cooperate uh, in producing uh, or in grammaticalizing non-finite nominal forms into finite forms. So the basic idea is we have information structure, nominalization and clefting that later on develops into finite structures of independent clauses. What I would like to do is I would like to look at the three domains, finiteness, nominalization and information structure, and then you can see all the overlapping areas. There is an overlapping area, Roman one here between finiteness and nominalization, another one between information structure and finiteness, and so on. And I will go briefly through each of these four uh, overlapping areas. So, the table of content of my contents of my presentation is rather simple. We will briefly look at the three basic domains, and then we will look at the four overlaps. And finally, after having presented you with a number of examples, and I think this is also in the sense of Polotsky's work to look at various languages and to show how, uh, how, this, form, how this works in, in other languages. And I hope that the Egyptologist will also be able to discover, in fact, since I also am interested in, in Egyptian and like Martin Haspelmann, I also, when I started learning some Egyptian when I was very young and nowadays I'm going through my Cop Coptic with uh, Leighton and so on, so I have certain ideas and I hope that I can present you some associations and ideas which I take from uh, other languages. 
Anyway, this is the table of content, so let's start with the three basic domains. First, very briefly, what is finiteness? I have a somewhat particular definition of what finiteness is. Uh, namely, uh, it, is, uh, it is about the presence of the overt marking of clauses as dependent or independent. So a language has a finite, non-finite distinction if there is an overt morphosyntactic marker from which the human parser can derive the status of that clause, whether that clause is dependent or independent. Uh, just two brief clarifications. Finiteness is not universal in my view, but there are just a large number of languages uh, which do make distinctions between finite and non-finite uh, forms, either in syntax or in morphology. And if there is such a distinction, then of course we can address these languages as making uh, finiteness, non-finiteness distinction. In my view, finiteness is a discrete phenomenon in individual constructions of individual languages, but that of course doesn't exclude a, a continuous approach as it is often done in typology because after on, later on you can uh, integrate uh, the different uh, typological properties of these structures into continua. Well, the categories involved, and I hope that these are not just diagnostics in terms of uh, Martin Haspel mark, but real criteria for uh, seeing, uh, observing the differences between uh, finiteness and non-finiteness. So the categories involved are, for instance, the locutionary force, tense aspect mood, person, politeness, case. So we sometimes have different case marking and dependent versus independent clauses and information structure, uh, for instance, rules concerning absence or presence of topic focus in finite or non-finite clauses. So that would be the basic categories involved. And sometimes in the independent clause, these uh, categories have to be present while they are not present in the dependent uh, clauses. So let's just look at an example from Abkhaz, which is a Caucasian language. In this language, you have a number of different uh, of different markers for of elocutionary force for instance that element here printed in red it is the declarative marker and it has to be there in finite clauses so this bait i saw him is finite uh, is independent can be uttered as an independent clause i saw him if uh, the same verb ba that is the root occurs in a non-finite form for instance in a temporal clause, when I saw her, you can see that the form is danisba, but there is no it, there is a zero there, uh, and that indicates that that form is not finite. Uh, on nominalization, nominalization is uh, semantically defined as a process of objectification or reification of a proposition. That's a very old uh, definition by Matisov, which I think is quite useful. Now, in real language, we start uh, at one pole, namely sententiality, and then we go down the continuum up to nominality. nominality. For instance, if we look at Lehmann's Klein, we can see, for instance, that the difference between, uh, so sentences loses their sententiality by first losing uh, differences in elocutionary force, and then they lose in constraints on elocutionary elements. There is no polarity, conversion of verbal into nominal agree, uh, government, and so on and so forth, until we end at the pole of nominality. Uh, to give an example from Givon, she knew uh, math well. That is, of course, a finite clause. That she knew math well is less finite. Having known math well, knowing math well, until you get at her good knowledge of math. So you can see that uh, here we have uh, uh, an increasing degree of nominalization going on from most finite to most non-finite. And that is, of course, then a continuous arrangement of things. I will not say much about information structure, just basically I follow Lambrecht's classical definition. Uh, the information structure is that part of grammar that is uh, concerned with the presupposition or the degree of activation of a concept in the speaker's estimation of the hearer's informedness. How, informed, how informed are my hearers and according to my estimation of their informedness, I will structure my language. So a topic is usually supposed as being activated and I'm going to talk about that 
that is what is a topic, and focuses information added to the hearer's knowledge by the speaker. Now, having introduced these three domains, we now look at overlap one, finiteness and nominalization. How do they overlap? Interestingly enough, if I look at the grammatical categories involved in that distinction, or you, you will find almost the same grammatical categories. So what is in red here is shared by both domains. So both domains, nominalization uh, and uh, finiteness, are characterized by presence or absence of elocutionary force, of tense, aspect, mood. Probably the only exception is politeness. And that, of course, creates problems of distinguishing finiteness from nominalization at the very beginning of a sentence. And I will try to show this by an example from, by an example from Khalkha Mongolian. Now, Khalkha Mongolian has a number of what they call verbal nouns. I don't list all of them, I just give you four of them. For instance, the first one here, ach, ich, and there is vowel harmony as well, which is called the future verbal noun. San, which is called the perfective verbal noun, Dak, the habitual verbal noun, and so on. And these same martyrs, or these same elements, are used in relative clauses, they're used in complement clauses, in adverbial subordination. I think for people dealing in Coptic and, uh, and Egyptian, that's nothing new, but the Khalkha Mongolian verbs do that too. And they are also used in independent clauses. Just a little example here, where you find the verbal noun in a relative clause. Now, relative clauses precede the head, so in four you have the last word, chon, means sheep, and itzen being the verb in that verbal noun form, oit, chon, itzen, chon, the sheep that the wolf ate in the forest. And the same form, sen, also occurs in complement clauses in five. The only thing is that the vowel gets lost if you add an accusative suffix to that form. So afsnik is the verb take with the verbal noun in the accusative and no is the verb I know that took, I know that bought. So you have a complement clause here uh, in which you have exactly the same uh, um, suffix, the same verbal noun. If you add an instrumental to that marker, so in the verb, the verb form in six here is ir plus ech, the verbal noun plus er instrumental, irechir. In that form, you have come verbal noun instrumental, and that is interpreted temporally, as soon as will have come, something like that, and then the action is going on. And finally, in seven, we find again the same form, ech, ach, as I said, there is a vowel harmony in that language, so the vowel of the suffix changes. So here we have ulzach in seven, meet verbal noun, and yum de copula in the finite clause position. So bit margash tendente ulzach yam. We shall meet them tomorrow. So this is uh, just illustration to show you that this form is multifunctional, it occurs in various different positions. How can we distinguish? between the finite and the non-finite use of the verbal noun, very often we cannot, because uh, the subject can always be in the nominative, in, the, in main clauses, as well as in subordinated clauses. But in the subordinated clauses, the subject can also be in the genitive or in the accusative. And if you find such an example, then we may be sure, well, here we are in the realm of a dependent clause, but otherwise, if you have no subject, and this, this is a radical pro-drop language, so you can easily drop your subject, then of course you will not know, and uh, speakers couldn't care less whether this is actually uh, a finite or a non-finite form, they just use this form. There are, however, other forms which are more limited, so uh, in that sense it still makes sense to distinguish between the different uh, categories, but not with these verbal nouns. So, on the way to the other overlaps, the similarity of the grammatical categories involved so far, uh, nominalization and finiteness marking on the verb, they of course further enhance the reanalysis of clauses in clefting constructions as finite, because at the very outset it is hard to make the distinction between nominalization uh, and finiteness at the beginning. So. Uh, 
what you often observe is that you have a cleft nominalization and clefting construction on the one hand, and then it silently or slowly or not so slowly, depending on the language, will be reanalyzed in terms of finite structures of independent clauses. And for doing that now, of course, we will look at the intersections with information structure, because so far we've only looked at nominalization and finiteness, which don't show us what happens if these forms are integrated into information structure. Now we will look at the two elements that uh, in, in which the categories uh, intersect with uh, information structure. Let's start with uh, the first overlap, finiteness and information structure. So finiteness, information structure, and here we have two different interesting aspects. On the one hand, I've already said that information structure can be an indicator of finiteness at the very beginning. That's what I've already introduced. And on the other hand, uh, this is also uh, information structure is also very important in clause linkage as such. So structures of information, uh, so the structures used for expressing information structure can also be used for clause combining for clause linkage. Let's start with the first, in which we look at, uh, at information structure, particularly at focus in that case, from the perspective of uh, finiteness. Dargwa, a Nachtagestanian language spoken in the Caucasus as well, is particularly interesting from that perspective. Because the language, at least for, certain, for a certain type of predicates, uh, has, uh, it makes the distinction between finite and non-finite, by way of using the predicative particles, predicative particles that express uh, truth values. So in a finite clause, these predicate, predicative particles have to be there. You cannot omit them in many, many contexts. For instance, one of them is the one, the first one here in yellow, zap, third person, present, affirmative, or the second person, singular, um, present and so on and so forth. I don't give you the whole list just to give you the flair of it. And now, interestingly enough, as I've already said, these markers are obligatory in finite clauses, but they are combined with focus. If you have verb focus, then these elements, these predicative particles, have to be suffixed to the verb, as in 8a. So you have muradil, murad in the ergative, the field, Bachan Zap. So Bachan is the neutral, so this is a gender language. Ach is so, and uh, then the past marker, and Zap, your third person neutral. But if in another instance you have an instance of uh, argument focus, then the argument takes, the argument in focus takes that marker. So in the case of 8b, Muradil zap, because muradil, murad is in the focus, in the ergative. Muradil zap ku bahunzi. So it was Munad who sowed the field. Uh, and then, of course, in that case, uh, one can see how finiteness and information structure ni nicely uh, go together uh, and, and in, in, in an interesting way. The second way in which uh, information structure matters is, of course, as I've already said, if if uh, elements of information structure are used for clause combining. There are many languages, I'm quoting one from Nilema, uh, an Austronesian language spoken on Solomon Islands, described by Brill. In nine, you first have to he as a topic marker. So, nahla, and they, topic, uh, and, and as for them, topic, they will eat excrements, and then natsoho, natsoche, but you, you will eat your taro food. So in that sense, then there is a contrastive focus between, uh, between these two topic, topicalized elements. But you can use the same marker, she, also in clause combining. So the same topic comment structure is used in clause linkage if the matrix clause precedes the subordinate clause. So in 10, you have the sentence, he almost doesn't work anymore because of his illness. And the, the, the element, he almost doesn't work anymore, is in the topic position. He's not working almost anymore or something like that. Topic, cause, he has illness. 
uh, he, and that's then how this is regularly done in that language. And I think I've seen similar examples in an other normal language, uh, like uh, Egyptian, for instance. Anyway, that was one type of overlap. Now we will look at nominalization and information structure, the third type of overlap. So in many languages, verbal nouns are used for relative clause formation and the same forms of the same verbal forms are also used for expressing focus and topic. So clefting and pseudo-clefting. One nice language is classical Chinese. As I said, I'm going to address an other normal written language, namely classical Chinese. In that case, the language that was written and uh, probably also spoken is at something between the 5th and the 3rd century BC at the time of Confucius and many other Chinese classics. Let me start with the ingredients. In subordinated nominalized forms, the subject can be marked by the genitive. So you have a simple genitive construction in 11. Wen Wang is the possessor, the genitive followed by Chu and Yong, value, valor. So the valor of King Wen. Genitive precedes, then you have the genitive marker followed by the head noun. Now the genitive marker in nominalized constructions, as in 12. So here you have something like what the D barbarians want. So you have a headless relative clause which can but must not, not that does not necessarily and is mark is not necessarily marked by the zhe, the nominalizer NML element here. But here again you see that Diren, the barbarians, are marked by Zhi, that genitive marker in red, Suo Yu, what want. So what the D barbarians want. Or you can uh, meet the same marker in complement constructions. So I clearly know uh, and then you have Wang the king, Zhi genitive marker, Bu Ren doesn't bear, and the copular clause. So uh, the minister clearly knows the king's not bearing it. Something like that would be the literal nominalized translation. This is one of the ingredients to the genitive. The other ingredient is the, 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 the um, copular clause which is noun phrase, another noun phrase, and facultatively, yeah. So NP is, NP1 is NP2, a very simple uh, sentence from Mengzi. So we have Shun, Ren Ye, Shun is NP1, Shun a name, Ren NP2 man, and Ye the equative marker, so Shun is a man. And now we can use these uh, same markers for focusing, for instance, in the case of object focus, we take just the same uh, sentence which I've already presented to you, namely what the D barbarians want. And you see here in 15, after the clause, what the D barbarians want, you have this ye element. Uh, uh, no, no, the, the, after the, you have the nominalized form, what the D barbarians went, <coughs> want, and then you have the element in focus, or to the my territory. So what the D barbarians want, is my territory, and in the end you find this ye element. Sentence focus constructions are available as well. It probably is just enough to quote the translation for you, which says, Confucius said, a sage is what I cannot be. I learn without satiety and teach without being tired. And that part, I learn without satiety and teach without being tired, is, uh, is now suffixed by, or is terminated by ye, the uh, equative marker. And uh, that is typical for statements uh, pointing out exhaustive information. That is what I'm doing and nothing else. So it is, one could argue, interpret this in terms of exhaustive focus. I'm uh, learning and teaching and that's what I'm doing and nothing else. I'm not a sage, full stop. Uh, so in that sense, I think that makes uh, also sense. The copula is also used as a topic marker in 17. Qiu ye, as for Qiu, Wei ji shi zai, shi zai, as for Qiu, he was the chief officer of the family, of the, of the Qi family. Or we can also combine whole clauses uh, uh, with, the, with, the, with that marker. So for instance, conditionals, temporal clauses as well. 
So in 18, you have master arrive preposition that country, followed by ye. Something like the masters arriving at that country, equative marker, it was the marker, the masters arriving at that country, bi wen qi zheng, then he always wanted to ask, he, 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 under any circumstances, he wanted to ask about how that country is governed. So in that sense, then, we have, uh, well, nominalization, clefting, and the analysis of the first element of that cleft as, uh, as, a, as a subordinated clause as well. Now, to summarize all of that, classical Chinese is a good illustration of how nominalization and information structure that is clefting and pseudo-clefting combine. But since there is no finiteness indication morphologically, uh, the combination of all three domains will be discussed in the next section. So in Chinese, we don't have that, the particular morphology we need. So let's look at what happens in information. Again, remember, information structure, nominalization, and clefting becomes finiteness. Let's look at Belhare, uh, a Sino-Tibetan language, uh, which ultimately is, belongs to the subfamily of Kiranti and is nicely described by Balthasar Pickel's work. In that language, we have a nominalization marker, hak and kak, and the k is dropped if, uh, if that, that element occurs word finally. This form is used, again, in relative clause formation, in embedding, and information structure and clefting. A short example of a relative clause is 19. We have internal relative or circumnominal relative clauses here. So the cigarettes I bought yesterday Nka I asin yesterday pepper cigarette, and then you have the verbal form by inungha, by third undergoer, first singular actor, and the verbal noun. Uh, the cigarettes I bought. So this is a relative clause. In other, uh, to, to give you an example of the equational construction in twenty, we have a very simple one. You, you juxtapose the two nouns un master, he teacher, he or she is a teacher. And you can also use that uh, element ha only for marking the predicate part. So I am one who begs and eats uh, with that form ha. Interestingly enough, the use of ha kak uh, in, in from, in, is, you can also, this is an example in 22 where I show how, or Bickel shows how ha is used for marking in information structure. So A is the context, when does she go? And the answer is, she has come. So this is against the presupposed, uh, against the presupposition that she goes, that she goes. She's actually actually just arrived. She came, and in that context, we use daina ha uh, for marking exactly that, for marking contrastive focus against the pre wrong presupposition. She has come yesterday, and she is not going already now. Now, of course, if one looks at an example like 22b, this almost looks like you are being used in a finite clause, but the context clearly shows, no, this is still not quite finite. This is still information structure there, and we are still dealing with nominal structures. And 23 is another example. If you hear the form ha negative uh, uh, her, here, that's actually misprint, sorry, negative here, inchoative, negative again, first singular verbal noun. You, uh, you would probably say, translate that I have never heard it. But the context in which it is uttered is a contrastive one, is, is focused. So this is not just exactly a finite form, it is still integrated into uh, a clefting construction. And this is as far as Belhare goes, according to Balthasar Bickel's description. But then there is a close relative to that Bilhara language, which is Limbu. It is just another language from the same family. And in that family, the same marker, which is Hahak in Bilhare and Ba in Limbu, uh, has become a marker of imperfective aspect. Uh, so, uh, with, uh, for instance, with telic verbs, it means it is connotative, try to do something. So in 24, you have, I tried to wake him up, Poksong Ba. So this bar is, is, but it is clearly finite. I tried to wake him up, but he didn't wake up. I will wake him up later, and so on. 
So if that analysis is true, of course, then we have a language like uh, Belhare in which the, <coughs> the marker, the nominalizer is still a nominalizer with clefting and the, in the next language in the family you see that it can be reanalyzed as a finite form. <coughs> now, to summarize what I've said so far, we've looked at nominalization and finiteness and we've seen that there is a broad overlap of grammatical categories involved, tense, uh, person and so on. We've also looked at IS, information structure and finiteness, in which we've seen that information structure can be an indicator of finiteness and that information structure can also, is also used in clause linkage. And finally, we looked at nominalization and information structure and, of course, at the combination of all three. And what we've seen is that, uh, in, in my presentation, if, is that uh, this overlap favors diachronic changes in which nominalized forms get reanalyzed as finite. In classical Chinese, that was one example, and Belhare and Limbu was another one. Now let's finally go back to Polotsky and his argument. Uh, this is just the same constructed example, which I have to offer you in a slightly, I, uh, in, in, in that way. Question is, is this transposition really? So is it synchronically, I mean synchronically from the perspective of the, of, the of the time when the language was used and spoken, is it synchronically adequate to analyze a sentence like one in terms of clefting that would yield the translation that the man cooks fish is in the pot? Or is it rather justified to argue that sentence one just simply means uh, the man cooks fish in the pot full stop? as a simple normal clause in which the clefting construction has already gotten reanalyzed as a, as a completely different finite structure. And of course I think uh, this is one of the big problems and that also showed up in the debate uh, between Polotsky and Gardiner. Uh, 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 Polotsky referred to that form that we find in the clefting constructions, the JRRF form, as the emphatic form relative abstract. So in his view, that was a nominalized form. But Gardiner, at the same time, interpreted that form as a finite form. He said that uh, this is the predicative form of the imperfective. So in his analysis, this would be uh, a finite form marking imperfective. Well, I'm certainly not the right person to decide that question, but I think it's, it's quite tricky and that leads me also to the distinction of written and spoken language in the end. If Polotsky is right, so we have the situation as I've described it for Belhare. So we have GRF is still associated with information structure even if the clause looks terribly finite. And on the other hand, if Gardiner is right, the situation is as in Limbo, that very form uh, is analyzed as an imperfective marker, full stop. As I said, I will not decide, uh, but I think the basic problem, and I have the same problem from classical Chinese as well, is that we simply very often cannot deci decide on the basis of texts. We need to have texts with clear context, and then we have to see, is it plausible to analyze this as a cleft, for instance? Is there a context in which one might analyze this form as focused or emphasized and so on? And of course, then the other question is, are there certain formal expressions? I remember this Wechsel form in which uh, th there, is, there are two of these uh, imperfective forms or clefting forms. If he wants it, he does it, for instance, and things like that. But again, one can reanalyze this in terms of information structure as well. And I think this is also what makes the situation problematic. We have texts. We don't quite know how to interpret them, how they were meant probably in, in the real context of when they were spoken. So that probably the question can be decided up to a certain extent, but there will always be limitations and problems. And that is somehow uh, what I would like to, conclusion, uh, to conclude here. I'm not sure to what extent it is methodologically possible to determine first if the form JRRF has become a finite form expressing imperfective, and if so, when that change took place, because texts 
uh, have their own inertia uh, as, as far as the written traditions. Orthography, we've already discussed that problem earlier, as far as orthography, but not only orthography, also uh, forms of uh, morphological forms and so on are transmitted. And I would like to conclude my uh, presentation with that remark. I've tried to give you examples from various languages that might be interesting from the perspective of what is going on in Egyptology and in Coptic studies uh, for further discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.